that you're here tonight. Any who may be visiting with us, we're especially glad that you have come, and we hope you can come back and be with us on other occasions. I want to raise a question tonight that will be the basis for a series of studies for the next several weeks. A very simple question, and the question is, is it a sin? And we plan to look at a number of things that the Bible labels as sin and give evidence thereof, but this is not the order necessarily, nor the exhaustive list. Is it a sin to drink? Is it a sin to gamble? Is it a sin to dance? Is it a sin to engage in premarital sexual relations? Is homosexuality sinful? Is it sinful to wear short attire? We may add some to that. We may not go in that order. But that is where we're headed in the next several studies. Is it a sin? And so let's start with the first that we have listed there. And that is, is it a sin to drink? Before we answer that question, I want to raise this question. And that is, what constitutes sin? To answer any of these questions, or any question that has to do with sin, we must define, first of all, what is sin? What is sinful? And how do we know something is sinful? And let's begin by noticing that sin is a violation of God's law. Here's a simple text that we want to remember all throughout the study. And that's 1 John 3 and in verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. And so John tells us that sin is a violation or a transgression of the law of God. Romans 4 and 15 says, where there is no law, there is no transgression. If a law is not violated, there can be no transgression of that. And so when we're raising a question, is it a sin, whatever the question may be, is this action a sin? The question is, does it violate the law of God some way? Does it violate some principle in the law of God somehow? It does not have to be specifically stated. In other words, we don't have to find a passage that says, Thou shalt not, and then fill in the blank, for it to be sinful. It's sinful if it violates the law of God. It may violate a command. It may violate a principle somewhere. Or here is a general principle of which this sin may be a specific application. We'll see that with a number of things as we go through this series. So let's raise the question, is it a sin to drink? And we're obviously talking about drinking alcoholic beverage. Is that a sin? Well, the question is not about drunkenness. We all know that drunkenness is a sin. So our question tonight is not, is it a sin to get drunk? Is it a sin to be an alcoholic? The question is, what about social drinking? What about drinking in moderation? Is that wrong? Does that violate the law of God? What about the occasional beer or the occasional wine? What if I occasionally drink, but I don't get drunk, I don't get intoxicated? Is there anything wrong with that? There are many Christians who would answer that question in the, in the negative saying, no, it is not sinful. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, they themselves and do that and engage in that very practice. We're going to look at a number of things in answer to that question. Our proposition tonight is to, d to demonstrate that it is indeed a sin. Well, let's start with this. First of all, that social drinking, drinking in moderation, is a form of drunkenness. Now, we'll reserve for a moment establishing that that is drunkenness. Let's just establish, first of all, something we all know, that the Bible condemns drunkenness. I won't spend much time here because everyone present, I think, would agree with that. Ephesians 5 and verse 18 says, be not drunk with wine. And so the Bible condemns drunkenness. In Galatians chapter 5, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And then he says, those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Among those was the sin of drunkenness. 1 Corinthians 6, that such were some of you. And he talks about the, the list of things that you cannot inherit the kingdom of God if you participate in those, and among those would be drunkenness. We all understand that principle. But let's move now to this concept, and that is that social drinking, drinking in moderation, is a form of drunkenness. Let's take the word drunk, like in Ephesians 5 and verse 18. Vine defines that as to make drunk, or notice what I've emphasized, to grow drunk. 
an inceptive verb marking the process or the state expressed in number one, that is in his first definition, to become intoxicated. So the word drunk, Vine says, it means to be intoxicated. Well, we all understand that. But he also suggests that it involves the process of becoming intoxicated. Marking the process or to grow drunk. Now let's notice a biblical passage wherein the term drunk is used that may reflect that definition that we just saw from Vine. That Vine is not off over here just whistling in the dark. What's going on in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 6 through 9? I want you to notice the contrast between the word sober and the word drunk. In this passage, you're either drunk or you're sober. If you're not sober, you're drunk. If you're not drunk, you're sober. It's one or the other. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. There's our word. For those who sleep, sleep in the night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. Now, drunk is put in contrast to being sober. But, here's a contrast, let us who are of the day be sober. In other words, don't be drunk, but be sober. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope of salvation. Now, the words sober, a vine says, means to be free from the influence of intoxicants. If I'm occasionally drinking, if I'm social drinking, I'm not free from the influence of intoxicants. Not free from the influence of that at all. So the Bible uses that term, sober and drunk in contrast, which harmonizes with that definition we just gave from, from vines. Well, let's notice the second reason why I would say that it is a sin to socially drink, and that is that drinking is, whatever you may drink that's alcoholic in its content, is strong drink. Now let's establish something that we all understand, and that is that strong drink is condemned in the Bible. Let's go over to the book of Proverbs, and notice in Proverbs 20, and in verse 1, that the proverb writer says that wine is a mocker, intoxicating drink arouses brawling, or strong drink is raging, the King James says. So here is strong drink, wine or strong drink is raging. So the Bible is condemning strong drink. We see the same thing in Luke chapter 1 and in verse 15. Drinking strong drink was, was forbidden, or at least it was something that was listed as a quality, abstaining from strong drink as a godly quality. I want to establish the fact now that drinks of today are strong by comparison to what we have or had in Bible times. The Palestine wines we are told, have 5 to 8% or had 5 to 8% alcoholic content. Now let's compare that with the distilled liquors of our day of 45 to 50%, more about that in a moment, where the malt liquors would have 4 to 6% and in some occasions has 10% and wines have 10 to 14%. If that which was 5 to 8% was called strong drink, what would you call that that has 45 to 50%? or that which has the same 5 to 8%, it also is strong drink. Well, let's talk about some, or give some quotations from some who have studied the Bible wines. And we'll give this from more than one source. This is from Robert Stein, from Wine Drinking in the New Testament Times, from Christianity Today. He said, in ancient times, wine was usually stored in large pointed jugs called amphorae. When wine was to be used, it was poured from the amphorae into large bowls called craters where it was mixed with water. That's an interesting point, which it is important for us to note that, that before the wine was drunk or drank, it was mixed with water. What he's saying, and others are going to say the same thing, that wine usually was not dr drank in full strength, but it was cut with water by a number of ratios that we'll talk about here in just a second. McClinic and Strong say essentially the same thing, that mixed wine is often spoken of in Scripture. This was of different kinds. Sometimes it was mixed with water to take it down, like Isaiah 122. Sometimes with milk, like in Song of Solomon 5 and 1. And sometimes by lovers of strong drink with spices of various kinds to give it rich flavor and greater potency, like Isaiah 5 and, and Psalm 75 in verse 8. They're saying essentially the same thing. Let's give a little more evidence. Everett Ferguson in Wine as a Table Drink in Ancient Times from Restoration Quarterly said that when speaking of ordinary drinking beverage, a writer may, say, may have said wine, for it was taken for granted that it was mixed with water and wine. A mixture of water and wine only on special circumstances was information given on the mixture. 
Well, let's go again. And this time from the ISBE, the proportion of water was large, only one-third or one-fourth of the total mixture being wine, only a smaller portion being wine itself. Again, I quote from Robert Stein, drinking wine unmixed was looked upon as Scythian and a barbarian custom. So generally, it was cut with water. Meaning by that, that the wine, by comparison, was strong. That is, our drink today is strong by comparison. Now, the church fathers, when they commented upon the ratio of water to wine, seemed to vary. But here's the one thing they all have in common, that the water and wine in being mixed was cut. That is, the wine was cut with water. For example, I'm not going to take time to read all of these. Some said 3 to 1, 4 to 1, uh, 20 to 1, Homer said. Pliny said 8 to 1. What I want you to see from that is they were all in agreement that there was a cutting of the wine, wasn't drank in its full strength. Here's the argument. The point being made is that drinks of today are strong by comparison to ancient wines. Now here's some information given from the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, again showing today's drink are strong by comparison. Remember the, the Palestine wines were 5 to 8% alcoholic content. Well, when we have a beer, 12 ounce of beer, regular beer, would have about 5% according to the National Institute of Alcohol and uh, Abuse and Alcoholism. A glass of malt liquor would have about 7%. Table wine would have about 12% alcohol. And distilled spirits such as gin and rum and tequila and vodka and whiskey would have about 40% alcohol. Again, the point is that it's strong by comparison to Palestine wines. And therefore, it constitutes that strong drink. Here's a third reason we would say that it constitutes sin and it violates a principle of God's law. And that is because it is harmful. It's harmful to our body. Now, without giving medical evidence, which we could cite, that it does harm the body because alcohol is a poison. It is a narcotic. It's a drug and it does damage to the liver and to the brain with various other parts of the body. But I'm more interested in this fact, is it a sin to harm the body when I'm doing something that I know deliberately is destroying my body? Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. And as you're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I will recognize that he's talking about fornication in the context. But he sets forth a general principle about fornication when he says, flee sexual immorality, verse 18. And he said, do you not know, he talks about the use of the body. He sets for the principle concerning the body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? In other words, this concept that it's my body, I'll do with it what I want, I'll use it as I want, I'll do to it what I want to do, doesn't fly. Because he said, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have from God, and you are not your own? This concept, it's my body, I'll do with it what I want. Paul said, no, 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 that's not the way it works. Your body is the temple of God, and, it, and you're to take care of the temple of God. Let's look at verse 20. For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. What I'm learning from that, from 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, is that we are stewards of our body to take care of a body that belongs to God. I'm not to deliberately harm the body or do something that I know is going to be harmful to my body. And so on that reason alone, it becomes something that constitutes a violation of God's law. If you don't get any other point this evening, I hope you'll get this one. And that is to understand a passage in 1 Peter. So get your Bible if you already, don't already have one handy. Or if you have your, your Bible tablet or your phone. You may want to look up some things as we look at 1 Peter chapter 4. I want us to see that drinking is condemned specifically. Yes, it's strong drink, and it is drunkenness, and it's harmful. But let's suppose we disregard all of that. The Bible talks about drinking itself as being condemned. And so let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4 and in verse 3. Now we get to 1 Peter chapter 4 in our Sunday morning class uh, quickly because next uh, week we're looking at chapter 4. We looked at chapter 3 this morning. But we won't deal a great deal with this verse because of having to deal with all the rest. But be that as it may, the text says, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime doing the will of the Gentiles. In other words, Paul, uh, Peter is saying, we've wasted enough of our life doing the things the Gentiles do. And it's time to get rid of all of that sin. What kind of things are you talking about, Peter? Well, things like this. When we walked in lewdness and lust and drunkenness. Now, I understand what drunkenness is. 
and so do you. And revelries and abominable idolatries, he said. All of that was, were things that we did when we were Gentiles and that needs to stop and we need to live pure and holy lives. But one of the things he mentions in that context is drinking parties. Or if you have the King James Version, you may see it say banquetings. What is that all about? Let's define that. One of the things we're learning in our Wednesday night study is that <clears throat> we take a word that we don't understand what it means if I'm not understanding it, I'm not readily seeing it in the context. Maybe I'm not finding a definition within the context. I need to look that word up and find out what it means. So let's see. Let's look at some translations of that. Banqueting, the King James. Drinking parties, New King James. Darby says drinkings. Darby is often quite literal and wooden in his translations. R.C. Trench says this word potas, which is translated drinking bouts or banqueting. R.C. Trench says it is a drinking bout, the banquet, not of necessity, excessive. In other words, Trench. Now, Trench is not a commentator. Trench is a lexicographer. He is giving word definitions. And what he's telling us is, in his opinion, this word means drinking, a banquet, and it does not imply within that word alone, it doesn't imply that it has to be excessive drinking. It's dealing with drinking, not necessarily excessive. I'm not talking about drunkenness. He had already dealt with that in the context, as we noted at verse 3 just a moment ago. Strong says this, to drinking, bout or carousing, banqueting, to imbibe, to drink giving us the impression that what he's talking about is drinking. Well, if you have the NET translation, and if you have a Bible program or Bible app, you probably can look up the NET, and you'll see a TN uh, by this word, and that stands for translator's note. And you can look up the translator's note, and here's the translator's note, that according to BDAG, that's Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich, and this word potas, the term, refers to a social gathering at which wine is served, hence drinking parties. He talks about it suggests something less sophisticated, more along the lines of a wild drinking, uh, wild and frenzied drinking parties. That's the association of the word as it's used within the context with other terms found in verse 4. Well, let's look at BDAG that is quoted here just a moment ago, a social gathering at which wine was served. Well, that sounds like social drinking, doesn't it? A social gathering where wine is served, you go at a social gathering, you sit down, you drink a beer, or you, serve, or you're, you drink wine, or you're not getting drunk, but you're just drinking socially. That sounds like what BDAG just described. Let's look at A.T. Robertson. He says this word, translated banquetings or drinking bout, simply means carousing, the old word for drinking, a drinking carousal. It means to drink, he says. Here only in the New Testament, in light of these words, it seems strange to find modern Christians justifying their personal liberty to drink and carouse to say nothing of the prohibition law. That's interesting. At times, Robertson would delve into being a commentator. Another lexicographer, another handbook at least, would say drunkenness may be rendered as, uh, as frequently getting drunk or constantly drinking too much, but in this type of context, the term for drinking must indicate a drinking of intoxicating liquors. So what I'm trying to show you is not just one isolated lexicographer or one isolated, isolated definition, but across the board they have reference to this has to do with drinking. Now let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 4 and in verse 3. What we're trying to establish is does the text say that it's sin? Does the text say anything about this? So 1 Peter 4 verse 3 said, We've wasted enough of our life, our past life, in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in, and then he lists a whole parcel of sins. Among those is drinkings, which we just saw definitions, that it means literally to drink. Not getting intoxicated necessarily, but drinking. Let's notice another passage in 1 Peter. Let's go to chapter 5 and in verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5 and in verse 8. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 says, be sober, be vigilant. Cause your adversary, the devil, walks about his roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You say, well, I, I read that and it didn't say, I didn't see the word drinking. I didn't see social drinking. I didn't even see drunkenness in that. But I do see this word sober. What does the word sober mean? It means be free from the influence of intoxicants. We already gave that definition from Vines a little bit ago. It means to be free from the influence of intoxicants. So if I'm sober, as per this text, I'm going to be free from the influence of intoxicants. It means to abstain. 
To be sober you means you abstain. That's strong, so it says that. Donegan's lexicon says the same thing. So if I'm not abstaining and I'm imbibing, though it's not much, I'm drinking an occasional beer, occasional wine, then I'm not sober as per the text. Well, let's notice another reason why we would say that it's sin. Because of the influence that it has upon others. So what do you mean the influence it has upon others? Well, moderate social drinking is the major cause of recruiting new drinkers. Common sense tells you that. You say, how so? Well, it's certainly not the drunk or the alcoholic. How many people start drinking and think, you know what, I think I want to drink just a little. I've been watching this drunk, and I've been watching this alcoholic who's lost their job and lost their home and lost their family, and I want to be like them is what I want to be like. It doesn't work that way. They want to be like the one who occasionally and socially drinks and seems like they handle that. Does the Bible comment on influence at all? Well, it certainly does. Let's go to Matthew chapter 18. Let's go to Matthew chapter 18. If my actions and what I do lead someone to engage in something that leads them to drunkenness, then I bear some responsibility for that. Matthew chapter 18 but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, if I lead someone else to sin, it would be better for him that a millstone were hung around his neck and they were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to the man by whom they do come. Jesus warned that when we are influential by our example to lead someone to sin, then indeed we are guilty ourselves. Now let's spend the rest of our time talking about arguments made to justify social drinking. And there are those who are Christians of the world. I'm not too concerned about at this juncture. But there are those who are Christians who say, I don't see anything wrong with it because, and here's some of the arguments that they've offered. Let's take a look at some of these. One of the first that you'll hear when someone says, when you tell someone, I don't drink, and I, and I won't go to this party, but we, we just don't drink at all. And you give some indication that it's not a medical thing, but it's a spiritual, religious conviction they will respond to you and say, you know what, Jesus turned water to wine. And you'll hear Christians sometimes make that argument. So let's go to John chapter 2. We've dealt with this a number of times and we tend to deal with that again. In John chapter 2, where Jesus turned water into wine. There was the first miracle at Cana of Galilee. Jesus did turn water into wine. Well, let's first of all start with this point that we've dealt with just even recently in our Wednesday night class as we were exploring definitions of terms. And that is, there is no evidence that the term wine here is, means that it was fermented at all. You say, well, it's wine. It mentions wine. Wine is fermented. Not necessarily. The term wine, the word translated wine, the Greek word onos, can be used of fermented wine having alcoholic content and it can be used of unfermented wine. Well, we all know that Ephesians 5 and verse 18, be not drunk with wine. If you get drunk on it, it must be intoxicated. It must have alcoholic content. Everyone agrees with that. But then there is, for example, the new wine in new bottles. You don't put new wine in old bottles, but you put new wine in new bottles. The new wine obviously has reference, Matthew 9, 17, in Mark 2, 22, to that which has not fermented and therefore is un unfermented and therefore has no alcoholic content. Let me give you further evidence in the Old Testament. So what I'm, what I'm learning though from that is that sometimes the word wine can have reference to unfermented. So how is it used here? There is no evidence that it demands fermented wine. Furthermore, in the Old Testament, we read of wine that is found in the cluster. While the grape is still in the cluster, it was called wine. It hasn't had a chance to ferment. It's still in the cluster. And so obviously the word wine can have reference to fermented or unfermented. But furthermore, in James, John chapter 2, if this context justifies moderate drinking, it would justify excessive drinking. And why would we say that? Well, I want you to notice there were six water pots, the text tells us. There were six water pots there, according to verse 6, containing 20 to 30 gallons apiece. So you take the 20, six water pots, 20 to 30 gallons apiece, that comes out to 120 to 180 gallons that if Jesus made water, turned water, take, took water and turned it into fermented alcoholic content wine, what he's making is he made 120 to 180 gallons of fermented alcoholic content beverage. If that encourages anything, that would encourage excessive drinking. And obviously John 2 doesn't give us any evidence that that's justified. Let's go to another New Testament passage. You perhaps have heard this when someone 
says, uh, they don't see anything wrong with drinking. After all, Paul told Timothy, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. Drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. It's the same word, by the way, in John 2. And there is no evidence that that is fermented. The word itself doesn't imply that in either text. It could mean that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that because it can mean fermented or unfermented. So there's no evidence that it's fermented. And furthermore, let's grant for argument's sake that it is. This was taking a little wine for medicinal purposes, for his stomach's sake. That's far contrast to the idea of social drinking. Here's a third argument that's made, and that is deacons in 1 Timothy 3 and in verse 8 are not to be given to much wine. Elders are not to be given to wine, but deacons are not to be given to much wine. And the argument is they can be given to it a little. They just can't drink a lot. Well, what that assumes is that they can have a little great assumption involved in that. That's not any better than the assumption that Lydia's household involved children when they were baptized, infants. That's an assumption for which there is no evidence. There is no evidence that they can have much wine. The forbidding of an excess of anything does not suggest that anything short of that is allowed. They're not to be given to much wine. That doesn't mean they can have some. And you say, how do you know? First Peter 4, 3 said they were not to have any. They're to be free from the intoxicants. They are to be sober. Now, one more I want to deal with, and this is one that is quite often used, and that is ancients have no way to prevent fermentation. And so we hear that, that in Bible times they had wine, and, and uh, maybe it was grape juice when it started, but they had no way to prevent fermentation. So it ferments quite quickly, and so if they drank it at all, it's going to have alcoholic content. They had no way of doing that. And so consequently, when they drank wine, there was no way to prevent that. Well, I credit Kyle Pope for the material that I'm presenting here. He presented this back in 2015, and he also quotes from William Patton, and I have William Patton quoted from him frequently in the book on Bible wines. Two things I want you to notice. Actually, there were four ways, four methods that were used, that could be used, and I won't give every evidence of this, and these were some quotations from some of the church fathers. Filtration was one process. Boiling is another process that was used. Dilution was uh, another process. And how they stored the wine was even another process. And you can consult William Patton Bible Wines, and I can give you the sources for that if you want to give access, or have access to that. So there actually were four methods of uh, preserving the wine. But I'm interested in this. Brother Pope himself did an experiment under the direction of two professors. And you've heard this before. But here's what, in Kyle Pope's words, his own words said. He said, uh, he, by the way, preaches out in Texas. He said, what I did was to hand squeeze 11 and a half pounds of black grapes into, and, to two, uh, and test two common methods the ancients talked about, filtering and boiling. He said, in May of the same year, uh, produced six tests, sample tests from the grapes that I had hand squeezed. The first was pure grape juice. The second was ju uh, juice filtered through muslin cloth. The third was juice was filtered and brought to a boil, and the remaining samples of the juice were filtered, boiled, and reduced by one-third, one-fifth, and one-tenth of the original volume. So he had several tests going under the direction of professors. And here was his test res results. He said these tests were, uh, these samples were stored in his office under the temperature that could have easily uh, been reproduced in Bible lands. The first testing was done at West Texas A&M University under the help of Dr. Pat <coughs> Uh, Coggin, a deacon at uh, Olson Park, that's where Pope preaches, by the way, who has a Ph.D. in chemistry. And then another test was done by Eddie Proc, a science teacher in Amarillo. And so here was the results of his test. And you can't read the fine writing here, but he has the categories. Here's the condition. Here was the unfiltered, and here's the filtered, and filtered and boiled, and filtered and reduced by a third, filtered and reduced by a fifth, and by a tenth. And what he found out that unfiltered after it had been opened a year later, or nearly a year later, had 12, anywhere from 12 to 6 percent, 6 to 12 percent, and another group had had 6 percent, but all of those that were either filtered or filtered and boiled or filtered and boiled and reduced all ended up a year later with 0 percent alcoholic content. And so what was his point? His point was the ancients did have a way of preserving it without it fermenting. 
That's just a fallacious concept. They have no way of, of, of preserving it, so therefore it, it fermented. And so if they drank wine at all, it was fermented. It is totally incorrect. So we've tried to answer tonight a simple question. Is it a sin to drink? Well, we've seen that it is drunkenness. It is strong drink. It is harmful. Drinking is condemned. It does influence others, and the arguments made to justify it just don't fit what we've seen from other texts. And so we may raise the question, why, why do we preach about this kind of thing? Why do we do that? Well, number one, it's a biblical subject, and that's all we need to know. But even though people, um, even in the church, even when we have enough problems is what I'm trying to say. We have enough problem when we preach against various sins that we're going to be talking about. We have enough problem of people still committing those sins. It would be much worse if we didn't deal with those sins. Take the sin of drinking. If, if we don't ever deal with it, we don't ever talk about it, and you grow up in this church and you, you're here for 20 years and you've never heard the first sermon on drinking, how much drinking do you think might be going on? Same thing with gambling and any other sin. And so why don't we talk about it? Well, sometimes when you talk about something that even though people know it to be wrong, it jogs their memory and it may prevent them from committing the sin, or if they do, it may help them to correct that sin. May God help us to understand what is sinful that we may abstain from that, be it drinking, gambling, whatever the case may be that we're going to be talking about in this series. There may be one or more present this evening who's not a Christian, who's not a child of God. Would you come believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject in any way, would you come while together we stand and sing? <laughs>